Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the first Superintendent of Schools Critical Conversation Meeting for the 2019-2020 school year. We'd like to send out some reminders. Uh, we are streaming live. We'd like to thank those stakeholders who are viewing and watching us live right now. We thank you for your support. We ask that you hold questions towards the end. We will have a Q&A portion towards the latter part of our program today, or agenda today. We also ask that you, if you're interested in attending future meetings, to visit our website at www.clayton.k12.ga.us for all future listings. We would like to recognize at this moment in our program our special elected officials and all of our supporters. I'd like to recognize our board member, our board chair, Ms. Jessie Gorey. If you'd like to stand, would you like to offer some greetings this evening? Good evening, everyone. I'm Jessie Gorey. I am the board chair. This also is my district, District 3, uh, the best district, uh, the district with the best principals and support staff. I see uh, Church Street in the house. Do I see Riverdale in the house? Both of the Riverdales, all three of the Riverdales are in the house. Uh, principals, could you stand up please since we're streaming? I, I just want to commend these very special principals for coming over. And of course, we have the best superintendent in the house, <laughs> me and uh, Dr. Morsi's Jay Beasley. in the mayor's house, that's Mayor Evelyn Wynn Dixon. So I just want to welcome everyone and thank you all so much for coming out and we hope that you're going to continue to be committed to high performance and being very involved with your children as we are very involved with their lives. And at this time, I'm gonna turn it back over to Jacob. Thank you so much for allowing me to give greetings. I don't see any other board members present this evening, but we obviously thank them for their continued support as leaders of this school system. And again, we would like to thank our illustrious mayor, Mayor Evelyn Wynn Dixon, and city council, city manager, and all of the administrative staff for accommodating us this evening. You are a longtime supporter of the school system, and we certainly value and appreciate you. And we're gonna turn things over to you to deliver a brief greeting, and then we will officially start the program recognizing our superintendent of schools and before doing so I would like to again recognize our school district leaders so we have our deputy superintendents present our district uh, chiefs present if you would stand to be recognized and school leaders again if you would stand to be recognized we thank you and wish you the best start of this new school year and without further delay we'll turn it over to Mayor D Evelyn Wynn Dixon thank you Lord, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the illustrious city of Riverdale. It is such an honor and a privilege to have all you fabulous people here. I love you. And before I go any further, I want to send out kudos to the principals and um, Ms. Dawkins and, Sam and Dr. Beasley and them. I put on a, a scholarship program that I've been doing for the last three years. Um, last year we did $350,000 in scholarships. And I said to Dr. Beasley and Ms. Dr. we don't have many Clay County children come out. You know people from Woodstock and all those people got a little change up there. They came down here. So I said, oh, um, our people got to be here. And I clapped give you kudos, they bought busloads of kids. It was fabulously attended. I was so proud, I just didn't know what to say. It was good, and then of course we give the scholarship to the graduates every year. So we really want to partner with the Board of Education and let you know what you're doing now. I'm so sick of people saying, and I'm gonna say, uh, I'm 
nothing I could be like about this preacher. Glad to see you come to glad to see me go. So I'm gonna sit down, but what I want to let you know is that what you're doing with the conversation piece and for the parents and, and me, even the things I don't know, to ask questions is gonna catapult us to a new level. Really, we got to be about it and go in the community and talk. We can no longer sit back and say what could have, should have been, and we're not doing anything. And the county is doing it. The school board, all of you, citizens and stuff are doing things. So as I take my seat, um, I tried to be struck like Jesse. I didn't bring my cane. So if my twist get a little twisted, <laughs> chalk it up to effort. Thank you for coming, Jada. And I'd also like to recognize another official who's present with us this evening, Representative Rhonda Bruno, Chair of the Clayton County Delegation, if you would please stand and be recognized. And I thought I mentioned it earlier, do we have any faith-based uh, leaders present with us this evening? If so, please stand to be recognized. Okay, well if not, we would like to welcome our wonderful leader, our superintendent and CEO of Clayton County Public Schools, Dr. Morsese J. Beasley. Thank you, Jada. Hello, everyone. Good to see all of y'all board members, our chair and mayors. Good to be back in Riverdale. We enjoy coming to Riverdale. We have to always highlight the great work that's occurring in Riverdale. Our principals in the Riverdale city of Riverdale, and uh, glad to see you all here. Of course, the staff, State Representative Rhonda Berno, just good to see you here. Let's see who are our parents. Where parents, where are you? Parents, where are you? That's very good. Very good. Well, we're glad to have you. So you got all of us here in case you have any questions about what we're doing in our school system. So this gives us a chance to really share what we're doing, give you a chance to ask questions, etc. One reason we're taking these, these meetings to various uh, other venues would be because we want more parents engaged. I think sometimes we, we max out in our participation at certain sites. And so we have on the calendar, you will see, we'll be going to some of our uh, non-traditional venues to have these meetings. We're going to hopefully where the parents are and where they will come and participate. That may include housing uh, associations. That may include extended stays. Wherever we can get a place where we can gather parents together, we'll have this conversation. We don't mind going to our parents. So here in Riverdale, I, I'll tell you, they, there's a lot of good work going on. And I have to always talk about Riverdale High School. And of course, they're doing well because of the schools that feed into them. In case you didn't know, Riverdale High School had probably one of the highest number of associate degrees earned in the school system this past school year in graduates. <laughs> this is it is. These young people at Riverdale were earning degrees. Every degree is good, but they were earning degrees in networking systems. I don't know if y'all know what that means, but that means they graduated from college potentially making six digit salaries right here in Riverdale. So we ought to be proud of our kids. And Ms. Miller Brown, Principal Wiz, come on, Principal. We, we're proud. And Ms. Miller Brown, she's back there. Stand up and be recognized. She, with her vision, she brought the, the bride, right? Into the school, began that partnership. We were able to just support it. I take no credit other than signing the MOU, whatever she sent me to sign. We looked, up, looked over it, it was good, we signed it, and she's been the one working, and her staff working with the professors, the instructors there, and motive, doing the hard work of really convincing students that that's a great opportunity. And so, it had, a, had only been, what, two years, right? And we have our third cohort. Right. And getting their associate's degree. Very, very good. And so, it's, it's clearly continuing the work, expanding the work. Riverdale. Grad rate, grad rate, it's not official, but what is it? It's 83.3. 83, 83, 83. Listen, why is that important? You go to a lot of so-called urban school systems in America. I'm telling you, 
headed toward 90% ain't happening everywhere. Excuse my bad English. It's not happening everywhere. And the strategy, every year we're seeing a consistent increase in her grad rate. It's just a matter of time before she's at 90 and above 90%. We need to support our principals when they're doing good work. Our administrators and parents and all working together to get it done. You know, we can find a lot of stuff wrong. And we'll talk about things, of course, that we need to improve, but we need to make sure our children, it's, it's amazing. I have I, I observed a pattern. Normally, when it comes to certain children, we always talk about what's wrong versus what's right. And I think we need to deprogram ourselves in that mindset, paradigm, that way of thinking and we should start making sure our children know how good they are, how much good that they're doing, and that we're very proud of them. I see board member Johnson is coming in. Let's give her a hand. We want to continue to support our schools and our students. And so to our principals, keep up the good work. Keep doing what you're doing. We know, we know that You've got to somehow, as a principal, bring it all together. And it takes you working with your teachers, your students, your parents, your community leaders, your business leaders, and of course, all of us outside of the school that are supporting the school, working with all of us to get the work done. And so keep up the good work. We have a presentation here, but I'm going to be very quick, as you, you probably well know. I want to spend a, a few minutes making sure you understand Some of the work that we're doing in our school system. We are working toward producing a very high performing school system. We've got a ways to go. But we have data that suggests that we're going in the right direction. I often tell people that the data that we're improving, it didn't happen overnight and it won't be necessarily fixed what? Overnight. But that's no excuse for not getting what? For, for not improving. And so we're improving. So you'll see today that we are moving in the right direction. But what are we doing? We're talking about building blocks of high performing school systems. This year, uh, we're going a little deeper in our conversation. We have some external uh, partners who are helping us to really have the right conversations and look at our work a little bit more uh, in depth so we can ensure that we're producing a high-performing school system. The data and the research is very clear that there are certain things that high-performing school systems do around the nation, around the world. And our commitment is to ensure that Clayton County Public Schools is a high-performing school system. This is not the work for the faint in heart. This is not the work for people who don't have children as their focus. This is the work of communities who are really committed to high performance, high performance, because this is the work that makes you challenge the status quo, that makes you really go deeper into your data, figure out what are some of the root causes, work collectively within the school system and externally, within your, your government, your agencies, partners, etc., to really come together and roll your sleeves up and get this work done on the behalf of children. So I just want to show you some of the, I won't spend time, we'll talk about these throughout the year, but I want you to look at the building blocks to a world-class school system. Notice the first one, providing strong families, strong support for children and their families before students arrive at school. Even before children get to school, providing support. High-performing systems around the world, there's a relationship between the support that they provide children before they even come to school and the high performance. That's why it's important in our new SPLOS that starts in January, we have our voters approve the creation of Riverdale's first early learning center. So we'll have an early learning center right here in Riverdale. Um, we're looking at possibly the three-year-olds to about second grade, third grade, but the committee will be working on that. The goal there is to get kids access to early literacy, whatever health care that they need, dental care, whatever they need. Uh, we'll have a WIC office there. We're working with the County Board of Health for that to occur. Whatever resources we need children to have before they get to school, we want to ensure that those families have that right there in school. The goal here 
is to ensure that our kids begin school not just at a minimal level, but exceeding what they need to have in order to be successful. We know that the first t state test that they take is in the third grade. It's important, as you well know, for students to be reading on or above grade level when they take that first test. But our goal is to get our kids in school as early as possible, get them immersed in a very literate, literacy-based environment, give them the support that they need in order to have more students be ready for kindergarten. Well, more than ready. Be well in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and beyond. Right now, just in case you didn't know this, we serve about 25% of our kids who are really eligible to go to pre-K in this county. They come to Clayton County's pre-K program. About 25% go to private providers. So we've got about 50% of our pre-K eligible kids in Clayton County that are not in any pre-K program. Just imagine where we could be if we could get those 50% in an early pre-K program, where we would be with our reading and our math, et cetera. And so that's important, providing support before they get to school. So that's one blessing I think the community has endorsed through the SPLOS, and we're working, hopefully, uh, looking at a, another one. More to come, potentially, on, on another pre-K center as we work out details. But provide more resources for at-risk students than for others. That's work that we have to do every day. We look at all of our students and we figure out where are the schools that are having the most challenges? Where are the schools that have the high mobility rates? We have, did you all know Clayton County has the highest mobility, one of the highest mobility rates, if not in the state? 32%. That means on any given day, one out of three of our students, they're coming or what? Or leaving. Now, when you look at our data and our trend going upward, in light of kids coming and going at that rate, you got to know we're doing good work, that we're doing the right work. Because a lot of people use mobility to make an excuse for their achievement. They assume that because kids are coming and going that it must be okay for kids to not be performing well, the data not to be improving. And that is not the case. I see we have Ms. Williams here also, our uh, board member. Wave your hand. Thank you, Williams. Sit in the back like she. <laughs> Develop a world-class, highly coherent instructional system. And we talk a lot about instruction in this district from what kids are taught, how it's being taught, how it's being assessed, and what we do with that data to provide additional support. That's not an afterthought for us. That is our work every day. So we're constantly looking at what's being taught, how is it being taught, how are we assessing that data, what does the data tell us, and what are we going to do to provide additional support to students. And that's one reason we believe that the data is going in the right direction because we are aligning, have a very coherent instructional system. Number four, provide clear gateways for students through the system to set, set goal standards with no dead ends. We want our kids to have options. Career pathways, very important. Very important. That's why we're pleased that in the next floss we'll have career pathways, a college and career academy. We'll have aviation programs and artificial intelligence and many other pathways in addition to all the pathways that we currently offer in all of our schools. Very, very, very important. Dual enrollment, advanced placement, all of these are pathways. If you want your children educated in Clayton County, there is no reason for them not to be educated here in Clayton County. We had last year, we graduated over 3,000 for the first time. We had over 500 of those students participate in dual enrollment. Now, not all of them earned a degree, but for them to be part, seniors participating in dual enrollment, over 500 out of 3,000, and that number has increased. So we're seeing more of our students taking advantage of all of the pathway options that we're offering here in Clayton County. You heard, you've already heard about the firefighter pathway. You've heard about the EMT pathway, um, Drew High School, Medical Magnet, Telling you all, they, there are options here in Clayton County. We have the only one of the only K 
fine arts articulation. You go from K Face to MD Roberts to Stillwell. K 12 fine arts articulation. You've got many programs, and you should, hopefully, if you were checking your emails, there was a press release the other day about all the school choice options so for parents to get informed so they can participate in the school choice process for next school year. Many options available to our students, grounded in equity, a fair process, giving every student what he or she needs. Number five, ensure an abundance of five high quality teachers. This is work that we've improved in. Uh, about two years ago, we had about 600 vacancies at the beginning of the year. Now we have down to about 150. So we got to get those 150 vacancies filled. But I often tell people what we're dealing with, we're competing in a very robust market here, aren't we? Teachers can come to Clayton, they can go to Fulton, they can go to APS, they can go to Gwinnett, the Cab. And so in order for us to be more competitive with teacher recruitment, we're recruiting them. What we got to do is retain them as well. Retain them. Because if you start replacing 500 teachers a year, within six years, you've replaced all your teachers. That is, we've got to change that. And so I often say, the superintendent has a responsibility, the staff, the principals have a responsibility, but all of us as a community, we have a what? Responsibility, because teachers, when they Google, when they graduate from college, they want to go to successful communities, don't they? And if your community has a whole bunch of drama and your children are perceived as out of control and this and that, guess what? They may come, but will they stay? They won't stay. And we've got to continue to change this. So we know we've improved. We've improved our teacher retention rate. But we should not be satisfied until we can say that we filled every vacancy in this district every year. And right now, we've got about 150 vacancies. Mostly, in, a lot of those in special ed, and we're dealing with the special ed shortage of teachers nationally. But our goal is to become so competitive as a district that teacher vacancies are no longer our issue. And we've got to continue to work toward that. Redesigning schools, we'll talk more throughout the year about how we're doing school choice and how we're really redesigning all of our schools to be those environments in which our kids want to come to school. They want to learn. They are valued. They're appreciated. They have a positive relationship with the adults in the building. Number seven, I've already alluded to, creating an effective system of career and technical ed. That's work that we're doing. You should know we have career pathways, again, in all of our schools. We'll have a college and career academy as we bring the new Marlboro High School online. We're going to be building a new college and career academy. More to come. Create a leadership development system. Always building leaders. Leaders, classroom leaders, school leaders. Leadership is very, very, very important. District leadership. And then, of course, a system of governance that basically supports high performance. Starts with board. Tenant, governance team, central office, principals, everyone working toward a common goal, a common vision of high performance. Easier said than done, but it can be done. Districts are doing it around the world, but it takes a collaboration, a collective effort on all of our parts. So, very quickly, what I want to show you. You all have seen our strategic plan goals, so I'll not necessarily go over those. Academic achievement, of course, is the first one. Orderly learning environments, number two. Creating an environment that really encourages collaboration and engagement, number three. Support services, timely and in budget, number four. And then, of course, recruiting, developing, and retaining very competent individuals, number five. That's our work. And so, our strategic plan has strategies aligned to achieving those goals. So we thought we thought we'd put this roadmap in here just to give you a little visual as to our work. We want to ensure that all of our students have access to quality resources, instruction, etc. 
that is our work at a minimum. While we're doing that, we've got to build the capacity of our teachers and our leaders to ensure that every child is getting the support he or she needs, the instruction he or she needs every day in every classroom. And number three, we've got to use our data. So our principals, they're, as they leave their campuses, they're looking at their reading data, they're looking at their math data, they're looking at uh, all the data, the discipline data, their attendance data, making very critical decisions about what needs to be occurring, what needs to be improving, how do they tweak their strategies in order to move the data. And that's one reason we believe and we know that the data is going in the right direction. Number four, and I'll spend a few minutes here, advanced learning for all. One thing we decided to do is move away from this remediation mindset where everything is always about remediation. Because if everything's always about remediation, and it has been that way for the last 10 or 15 years, guess what we're going to keep dealing with? The same thing we've been dealing with. And so we acknowledge that there has to be some remediation. But we have decided that instead of always remediating everybody, let's figure out how to accelerate everybody. Accelerate. The example that I use is this. There are many adults today who are functional adults who don't necessarily read on a college level. But does that mean that they're not buying cars? Does that mean because they're not reading on a college level that they're not buying homes? Does that mean that they, they still have to read a contract to buy a car, don't they? They still have to read a contract to buy a mortgage, don't they? So if you operate from the premise that most of society can't read on a college level, you're really operating from a deficit mindset. So what we decided to do is help people figure out, our young people figure out the strategies that they need in order to accelerate themselves. And as we do that, what we're noticing is that what you say they can't do, they really can do. They really can. It's all in one's perspective and all in one's approach. And so we're advancing learning for all students. And so what does that mean? At the elementary level, our kids engage in problem-based learning. You'll see more of that in all of our schools. At the middle school level, sixth grade, all of our sixth graders are taking accelerated math. Why are they taking accelerated math? You say, I don't know what that means. What it means is that in sixth grade, they're going to take all the sixth grade math plus half of the seventh grade math. In the seventh grade, they're going to take the other half of seventh grade math plus all of the eighth grade math. And in the eighth grade, they'll take algebra. So we're the only district right now in the metro area that I'm aware of that's offering. In two years, we'll be offering algebra to all of our eighth grade students. The point being, algebra is a gatekeeper course. We've worked with Clayton State University and some of our other partners. And the data is very clear. If we can get kids successful in algebra, then we can get those kids out of high school. We can get them successful in that first year in college. And the amazing thing about our strategy is if, let's say, a student is, is in eighth grade algebra and he or she is challenged, we can offer another algebra course in the ninth grade. And so that student gets another year of algebra, which only strengthens or increases the likelihood that they'll be successful in algebra. And then, of course, engaging all stakeholders. That's why we have meetings like this. As we talk about advanced learning meetings, engage our stakeholders. We're engaging our stakeholders today. We do meetings like this throughout the year, whether in this venue or in other venues, at the schools, etc. We want our community to be, to be really engaged and to know what we're doing. We want to hear from our community. I can assure you that every strategy that we're implementing is grounded in us engaging our community and grounded in what is best for our children, moving our children to higher levels of performance. And then, of course, we want to continue to ensure that our kids are ready for graduation. Realizing that our kids, when they graduate from high school, they may have opportunities and jobs offered to them that did not exist when they entered high school or when they began their pre-K or kindergarten journey. So we've got to make sure we're developing the right skill sets, the literacy, the numeracy skill sets, the critical thinking, communication, collaboration, creativity, so our kids can navigate the uncertain future that exists for all of them. Think about it. The kids who are in pre-K today, they will graduate in the year 2034. That is amazing, isn't it? And 
16 years later, after they graduate, let's say they graduated at age 18, at 16 years, they'll be what? 50. Hey, I'm no, 16, that's 40, right? They'll be in the year 2050. 34. 18 and 16? 34. So in 34, at the age of 34, I had to think about that. At the age of 34, think about that. I, yeah, I was a staff teacher. <laughs> I had to. <laughs> I was a pretty good one, too. I had to mind you. But think about it. At the age of 34, they'll be in the year 2050. Now, I plan to be here. But the truth of the matter is, in 2050, I'll be close to 100 years of age. You say you'll be here, my man. <laughs> but think about it. We're preparing kids for the year 2050. Does that ground you to make you think how awesome our responsibility is? That is an awesome responsibility. So, we won't go all, all of that. All of this is things that we discuss. But it's very important, you all, very important, that we get around our schools and we support our students. And so whether it's about instruction, we gotta support what's happening in those classrooms. Whether it's about parent engagement, we gotta make sure that our parents are informed and they have every opportunity to participate in what's happening in our schools. We've got a lot going on in our school system. But all of these strategies, if you will, collectively are moving us in the right direction. They're moving us. You have here a handout that gives you some of the accomplishments, if you will, that we've had in the last few years. I want you to make sure that you're informed so that when you talk about Clayton County with your community members, you can help inform somebody else, inform someone else. You know, oftentimes people are looking for perfect situations, but I can assure you, you will not find a perfect school system. But you will find people who have a perfect heart toward children to move children forward. And I believe that this district is really engaged in the work of fundamentally shifting, moving the data, moving our children forward in ways that will significantly improve the quality of their lives. So just take a second to look at that. You'll notice, even on the first page, there are opportunities, because we need more of our kids reading and doing math on or above grade level. But I can assure you, it won't happen just because we say it needs to happen. This takes strategy. It takes strategy and people what? Working together to get it done. It takes strategy. And so when we talk about literacy, that's strategy. When we talk about advanced learning, strategy. When we talk about school choice, it's strategy. It's strategy. But we need all of our community to understand the dynamics of what we're dealing with. I wish every kid came to school ready, whatever that means, but they don't all come ready. I wish all of them finished every grade level on or above grade level in reading and math. It is not the case. It is not the case. But do we have strategies that we're using to address literacy? Yes. Are the strategies working? Yes, they are. Is there room for improving those strategies? Of course there's room. But everyone has to do their part. So take a minute to look at the accomplishments. You also have this slide here that just gives you information about the school system. It's important, it's important that you, us, as a community, that we are informed about what's happening in our school system. So we're here to engage you, to ask uh, you if you have questions of us. 
so we can share whatever information we may have as we move the school system in a new direction of high performance. It's not easy work, but it is necessary work. So at this time, we're going to see if you have questions, if you have comments, we want you to share with us on
dealing with the schools that, you know, if you don't get past that, there's a problem everywhere. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. And what I've been proposing or talking about or formulating, a couple years ago, we had at the camp, we had a summer camp here, and we had the kids read, uh, the, uh, the older kids read for the younger kids, got the books from Riverdale Library, and it was a pretty big success other than the kids from the book home. But other than that, and the thing that I think, uh, I'm trying to think a little bigger now, that I think if we, we can do it here in Riverdale, but I think we can collaborate with you guys, but it really has to be, we need you guys to be a part or to oversee, but not necessarily oversee, but to be a part to monitor what goes on with the third grade reading level and I'm getting to the rec centers. Uh, I'm listening to Chairman Turner. He said, that's not a bad idea. Is at some point, I know there's a high school during the summer, there's football camp and all that, but I just feel that there's a way to have the older kids in the summer read to the younger kids for 30 minutes, once or two or three times a week. But it's only going to work if uh, we have, like, the, the, the county. Uh, they have rec centers. I'm not sure all what you guys do with the gyms in the summer. I don't, you know, I don't know about football. But in the cities, to have the, the older kids read, instead of paying the fee for those teenagers to come in, read to the younger kids. And I think that can be done um, in some form or fashion because we, we did it here. But that's a, just an idea uh, because that, that, that reading in third grade, you got to with the three problems with keeping there at that level third of third grade. Absenteeism, uh, that, that's one problem. Um, I can't think of the other one. A absenteeism, I can't think of the second one. But that third one is summer reading law. We can fix that one. We can fix that one if we come together and, uh, and all the camps around form a fashion have some of these teenagers be to those young kids. So I'd like to talk about that. And so I think you all, I think it's a great idea. I would just encourage it. The way you fix some of these laws, and I've done some programs, uh, the way you, you fix some of these laws is kids need to be reading year round. Mm -hmm. uh, summer slide doesn't occur. So what we've got to do in Clayton County, from the superintendent's perspective, is create a culture of literacy. That means all of us need to be reading and modeling reading to our kids every day, everywhere we go, in every capacity. Um, it has to be an expectation. And our kids can't see reading as not being cool. I mean, we got to take away that stigmatism where, you know, kids who are reading are considered nerdy and this and that. Everybody needs to be modeling that reading. But those type of um, opportunities do help. Another one I said, they tough. They're not going to fix that problem. This is years of experience in that. Summer, summer slide will occur. The best way to remedy summer slide is to create a culture of reading in the home, in the school, and beyond the home and school and all these other places that our children go to. So children are constantly reading reading all the time. Um, I encourage you to partner with your school, and I'm sure you already do, to read to kids. That's very important. Being read to is very important. But at a certain time, at a certain age, being read to is not your solution. You need to be reading yourself. You've got to be reading. And so one thing we encourage our young people to do is we have tools that our young people can take advantage of K-12. We need our young people using those tools. And I'm pleased that they are using the tools, but I believe that there's an opportunity to use those tools even more to really improve those literacy reading skills and math skills. Got an email from a parent the other day, uh, basically acknowledging how the tool helped her child. They went to middle school, they were several grades behind, and in a year or so, they're already up. Uh, they're less than one year behind. Several years, now one, and they, they attributed to the use, the consistent use 
clearly the parent took ownership as well, working with the school, the consistent use of that tool, which allows students to get reading instruction and assessing them, give them targets, et cetera. And so what I agree with, I just want everyone to really understand that reading and getting rid of this gap is something we all have to do, and it has to be a year-round I wanted to piggyback on what Councilman Grossman brought up and the fact that the conversation that I've actually had with Dr. Beasley. As you all know, I have a real job. I work at the Parks and Recreation part-time. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things that we offer in the summertime is we have summer camps. And I've suggested to Dr. Beasley that one thing I think would also help us with uh, that summer slide or whatever you want to say, is if the Parks and Rec and Clayton County Board of Education would partner, and instead of us just having kids at summer camp all summer just playing, <laughs> that if we would uh, take that time and partner and let the school district have those kids for half a day, and then the other half they're at the rec center, and then they <coughs> flip, and you know, that way, it would not only would it help us with the summer sliders, it would also help us with some other things. I think it would take away a lot of, you know, if during the summertime the crime rate goes up because we have children that are idle. And I think that if we use some of our title funds or whatever, and if we could partner with some of the other cities as well, because Riverdale has summer camp, Forest Park, the city of Forest Park also has a, a summer camp, it would be a really nice thing. Another, you know, this past year we also gave a one of our graduating students, well actually he didn't graduate, it was a posthumous diploma because the child drowned before graduation. And one of the things that happens in the summertime, one of the leading causes of death for our children in the summertime is drowning. So I'm just looking at several things we could do. We could um, continue being educated across the summer, we could have some fun, recreation, and we could also uh, teach our children how to swim so that we don't end up with those type of statistics. And so it would, it, I, the other thing that I really wish that something that the board members, I think we need to talk to, we're talking about pathways, but one thing that I think is very important in producing productive uh, students and citizens is giving back. And uh, when my daughter graduated from Atlanta Public School, she was required to do 75 hours of community service. Mm -hmm. I would really like to see us make that a component of graduation for our students. And they could then do those things, like you said, reading with the students. A lot of our high schools are actually located right across the street from elementary schools. It would be nice to have that partnership of having some of our high school students, you know, going over to elementary schools or going to the middle schools and uh, mentoring and doing those types of things. So those are all you know, great ideas, and I'm hoping, I know Dr. Beasley said he had a great idea. We've had these great STEM camps uh, that we did because we're talking about you know, doing other things instead of remediation, and I had the pleasure of sitting with both of the Ebony's, Dr. Lee and uh, uh, Ebony Brown, look, I think I can recall another last name, and we were also talking about the foundation because we're talking about, uh, we have a lot of kids, as Dr. Beasley said, that are coming to us that don't have a pre-K experience. And it would really be good too with those that are in pre-K for us to do the bridging between pre-K and kindergarten. So those are all some excellent ideas and uh, I, I know we'll definitely be implementing some of them. Relevant to the Park and Recreation team is already working with the Park and Recreation to see how we can have some type of program next year that will incorporate kinesiology along with literacy problem solving. I don't know if you all know, but kinesiology has a lot of math and science and STEM involved. It's a very rigorous problem solving. And so we're working to see what we can bring online next summer relative to parks and recreation. And also we had a conversation recently with the uh, police police academic so we're trying to see exactly how they can help us uh, in addition to our middle school program, after school program that we're doing in our schools. Just to make sure kids have more opportunities to read, be 
engaged in thinking and doing math, et cetera. So more to come. Good ideas. Hi. Um, I just moved to this area. I just bought my first home in October. I know. Um, <laughs> and with, um, I have my two children, and they're um, in the elementary school, right off the road, Church Street, as well as Riverdale Middle. And I just have a concern from a parent standpoint, wanting to know what can I do for our kids. My youngest son, that, that is in third grade, um, he is reading all grade level um, due to that I'm, you know, in early childhood education. But he has, he has um, a speech impediment. But unfortunately, he only, his IEP requires him to have his speech um, at least three times a week, but he only received it once this year. Um, I emailed the teacher to, to kind of ask, you know, what is the name of the speech pathologist so we can get in communication. Um, unfortunately, I haven't heard anything back um, with that, so I just wanted to know, as a parent, since we know third grade is a critical year and moving forward, and if you aren't, if you're unable to speak, how can you read? So means his IEP requires him to have these plans, but it's what can I do or to move forward with him getting what his right with his IEP at the time he you know he needs to do it? And I understand we have a vacancies with the special education, we, but in the meantime, what can I do? Well, what can be done? Because unfortunately, once these milestones come, it, it, it's really not going to look at a state of well, he didn't receive his three times a week on these things. It's like okay, well, he's not on this level. And I'm raising young African American men in America, and I need, I, there are certain things as we know with the, the climate of this world right now. What elementary school? Uh, Church Street Elementary. Church Street over here. You're your principal. I know Mr. Winter. Thank you all. First time I'm here, I'm senior tonight. I'll speak service starting week two. We have a person that five days a week teaching service for students every week. So if you have a problem that you don't, we'll make sure that we're doing both and that we have a copy of the IEP and that you know our case. Yeah, yeah, you guys have a copy because I brought it with me when we moved from the. Um, and then another um, thing I have for my other son, the Riverdale Elementary, um, he loves the school, he likes the school, but unfortunately, um, the, the, he's a small group, but he says that the room is so chaotic that he's unable to focus. And it's Riverdale Middle. Um, Riverdale Middle. Riverdale right here. Right there. So what can I do to make, because I don't want him to. So what I'm doing is I'm modeling for this community the importance of us understanding the role of the school principal. Okay. And that's who I hold accountable. So when you have issues at the school, you may begin with the teacher, but let's say you don't get the time to respond. Every school has a principal. And that is the role of the who? Principal. So I would expect those principals, and I know they will, to hear those concerns and to address those with you toward solutions. Um, realizing that not only is your child potentially being impacted by that classroom situation, but the other children are also being impacted as well. In transportation, who do I speak to about transportation? <laughs> <laughs> because um, <laughs> the principal. You <laughs> so your principal, this is important. Your principal is uniquely positioned to help you. And then if he needs to reach out to transportation, that's his responsibility. <laughs> They're here, but here's your principal. Because <laughs> I want you to understand that you don't have to get frustrated if, if, if you, let's say you can't reach them. Okay. You've got a principal who is if your advocate working with the superintendent and everyone else to get that issue addressed. Right. And so if the principal is not aware, that's the first thing we've got to start doing is making sure the principal is aware so he or she can make sure that they work with those who are in position to support the school to address that concern. Sometimes people come straight to transportation, they'll send it to me or Borman, whatever, and we'll address it. But I like people to go to those principals because you'll be amazed. If you go to the principal, you'll be amazed at the issue being resolved probably a whole lot faster. Um, and MD Roberts. My question is more for my older child. So, um, how 
how are we going to address the students who are in special education as it relates to the advancement placement program that you referred to earlier? Because you know, like it, he has an IEP and he's already a grade or two grade levels behind in math currently. And you're putting him in an eighth grade and he's only seventh grade class, that's three years behind. You don't want them to feel like they're struggling or they're failures because they can't grasp it. So what are we doing to help with that? That's a good question. So let me help you understand the concept of acceleration. It doesn't mean that we don't acknowledge that the child has some deficits that he, he or she is not behind. As a matter of fact, on the contrary, we recognize that and we work to address those deficits, but we don't just stop at addressing the deficits. We also make sure that he has the foundational skills to even get to the sixth grade or the seventh grade content. And so we do some compacting or chunking of information as well. You'll be amazed. The research says this, that students who are behind, if you accelerate them, they have a tendency to catch up faster if you accelerate them versus spending all their time on remediation. It's just that our minds, what you think, sometimes we think that, oh, they need to be remediated, they need to, they need the support. Yeah, that's what, well, that's and what so I, that's what your child is getting. But we have, we have at the middle school level, since you mentioned the math, sixth grade, we have students who are going to be identified to get the sixth grade and seventh be accelerated, but they'll get additional support. So your son or daughter may be one of those individuals that will be getting that additional support. But not to be concerned that they're a year or so behind. Uh, the teachers are going to address them being behind, but they're going to also get that acceleration along with that support. I guess that's what I mean. Like, what kind of support are we going to be offering for them? Like, would it be well, the one thing they, they get a modified, they get a modified curriculum and additional support, so they get the same content, but it's at a different. I don't even want to. It's at a different pace, if you will. The teacher is more prepared to really address that deficit that they may have that could be impacting how they learn the new content. Um, of course, tutorials are always available. But I think the, the key thing is they're going to be getting that support for whatever content they may have not necessarily mastered as of yet as they learn the new sixth grade and seventh grade content. But you'll be pleased, so maybe this time next year, we'll have a conversation. You'll be pleased to hear that they'll probably learn a whole lot more in an accelerated environment than they would have otherwise. Okay, and I have one more question. When you were talking about, like, I don't have this problem with my <coughs> middle my elementary problem. Mr. West is very, you know, you ask him open door policy, and I love that. At my middle school, it's, you, you tell us you want us to be involved, to come and, um, be a parent and be involved, but when it's an unfriendly environment and um, unwelcoming environment, um, especially if you take over the principal, but talking to the principal is not welcoming or even talking over you. Right. How are we going to address that? Well, that's a great question. So for every principal, there is an assistant superintendent who supports the principal. I want school leadership led by Dr. Simpson to stand up. So. Principal, yes, is at the school. But if you have issues at that level, then you always go above the principal and you reach out to school leadership because every principal <coughs> is accountable to an assistant superintendent. And we want to know if it's unwelcoming, if it's unfriendly, if you're not being heard because that's not the type of culture that we're going to have in the school system. Period. At all. Dr. Effie Lee, before you leave here today, she'll connect you to the 
Okay. And likewise, my name is Michelle Dawson. I am an environmental health and safety uh, professional. And so my question is, in view of all of the things that I'm hearing in the news about Clayton County, a lot of the other class counties, um, I was very disturbed when I heard some of the things that have been going on in the school system, having graduated two daughters from Clayton County schools years ago when they both went through school, uh, went to college already. Um, but my question is, in terms of safety, how do I engage? How do I get engaged? Because I'm trained. I'm trained all over the country. Now I'm back home. And I really want to get involved. And when I talk about training, I'm even talking about some of the stuff that I'm hearing out with the company out in, uh, in Cobb County. My passion is educating people where you live, work, play, and pray. That's my passion. And that's what my mission statement is for my business. And so my question is, how do I get engaged with the school department? Well, you probably need to figure out exactly what department. I don't know you. You sound like you the training and things of that nature. You probably should have a conversation with Dr. Lee and he's going to kind of help you figure out exactly what you need. Thank you. However, it'll say pending and it takes about two days for them actually to, to get through to the point. So I don't know if that will happen to you or if it's just something wrong with the, with the app. <laughs> so Mr. Walker, we'll take, we'll take transportation, we'll take a look. Okay. Any other questions, comments? So what I'd like to do is close out with a few, a few charges, if you will, to our community. So Jay, let's go to the charge slide. And I just want you all to think about this and think about your role, your expertise, your experience relative to the work that we're doing to really move our school district forward. You know, the app, Mr. Walker, those are the technical pieces. And we'll get those technical pieces right. The most complex work is the work of actually improving the school system, the outcomes of our students. Because we've got 50, over 55,000 students all in various places and different experiences. And, and so we've got to really work to move them. We've got to deal with discipline. We've got to deal with teacher and leader quality. We've got to deal with parents. We've got to deal with all these complex variables to really move every school forward. And that's our challenge. Every school. Every school. And so we want you to continue to work with us to create that very collaborative environment. It's very, very important. We want to hear about those experiences, the good ones and the not so good ones, because that's what it takes for us to get better. Because if you're having a challenge with the app, more than likely someone else is having a challenge with the app. And we realize we just rolled it out this year, but that's okay. That's why we have these type of opportunities, and it gets better as we engage. Branding, marketing, and all entities, entities operating as PR agents for 
change. I often say this. I had a, I was here at an event there, and someone mentioned to me, you, I think you were in the presence, and they mentioned to me, they didn't want their taxes to go up. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, if you're going to improve the school system, your taxes are going to go up. Y'all understand that? Because if you improve the school system, guess what's going to happen? Housing values are going to do what? And if your housing values go up, then what's going to happen? So I gotta help make sure people understand got to understand how this works in America. Every high performing school system, housing values do what? They go up. And if housing values go up, then what else goes up? Taxes. <laughs> but what we got to do is make sure people understand that we're good with the high performing what? School system. It doesn't mean that we want to tax folks out of there, you know, beyond where they need to be taxed. But I want people to understand, you can't say we want a high performing community and then think that it's free. It's not free. But we got to make sure that we promote the good work in our school system. We got to make sure that we, as a community, collectively, are the public relations people for our school system. Because really, when we talk about our school system, who are we talking about? Our community, our children. And I've seen a lot of high-performing communities in the nation. One thing that they don't do is talk about their what? Their children. You know why? Because they realize the children are just what? And we've got to make sure. Yeah, we got problems. But you all, we cannot define ourselves by our problems. Every family has problems, right? But you deal with the problem as a family, but you still remain a what? You still remain a what? A family. Parents and guardians and students and support, we want to ensure that we're active and engaged. We need to see more of our parents engaged. So I'm not talking to you all, but y'all are here. We got to continue to talk to other people in the community. And we've got to go wherever they are to have these conversations. When our kids look up, you know, when we say we support our children, they look up in the stands at athletic events. And we're everywhere but supporting our children. I know we got to work. But I'll tell you this if you can't go to support your child, find somebody who what? Who can. Our children need to see us. They need to see us. And honestly, we got to communicate. You tell your child, if I can't be there, I'm going to make sure somebody's there to support me. Because sometimes things happen. You have to work late. You got things you got to do. But we got to just do a better job at ensuring that our kids look up and they see who? They see us. When I say us, whether it be the parent or those of us in lieu of the parent and local parentis, they need to see us supporting them. If they're having challenges with reading, they should be able to come to who? Us. And they shouldn't feel ashamed to let us know that they're having challenges. I heard about a kid the other day, and I was very pleased how the staff had been. It was at Drew High School. The young man was reaching out, frustrated because he wanted help with reading. Reading. And I was glad to hear how that staff came together to give that young man the help that he needed. High school students do not buy into the myth that our kids don't care. They do care. Do not buy into the myth that wants to color our children as if they don't want, they do want. If you travel this world, most people in the world, if not all of them, want what's best for their families. The thing that prevents it is systems and structures that are oftentimes put in place by other people that prevent those families from maximizing their potential. And we as a school system have got to be sure and ensure that we don't put systems and structures in place that will compromise the outcomes of our children. Very important. Highlight the talented staff and students we have. Talk about, tell people about the dual enrollment and the number of kids earning associate degrees and more kids are graduating. And our kids are engaged and 
firefighter, an EMT pastor.